Alrighty, let's knock this one out. It's uh, your simulated social experiment experience for uh, Wednesday, August 2nd, 2023. Gonna try and keep the uhs and the ums to, to a minimum. Uh, trying out some new audio stuff too. Welcome in. I made a grave mistake. Uh, I, I turn away from the mic for a second. I see myself at a crossroads. I'm being accosted by various politicians. They tell me they're socialist. I, there's, it's, uh, I don't know what's going on. Uh, there's bread lines, uh, poverty, there's a crossroads. I, I turn left, uh, I turn left again. I keep turning left and I end up in, uh, some sort of crypt keepers, uh, mansion. It's underground. It's a bunker. He's a operator. He's got Oakley sunglasses. He's the man in the Oakley sunglasses. The man in the Oakley sunglasses haunting my dreams at every crossroads where the politicians aren't what they say they are. Why why does that always happen with politicians? Why does it always happen with the people? Why do why do the people who are deceiving me always deceive me? I don't get it. You know what I mean? I will say I made a grave mistake that I'm going to amend. <clears throat> it was probably a bad idea to w <laughs> to watch Valerie in her Week of Wonders as like a an example of Czech New Wave cinema. I didn't watch Lily Chocho, uh, but I did go with another Japanese film Instead, hold your horses on Lily, uh, all about Lily Chocho, if you're, if you're into that sort of thing. But yeah, <clears throat> we've got uh, a cult from 2009, which I totally know the director of. It's, um... The, uh... Well... Kiyoshi Kurosawa is a director who's featured in it, but uh, Occult. It's a film by Koji uh, Shiraishi. Shiraishi. Koji Shiraishi. I wonder what this person... Is this the... I think he's an, a character in here, Koji. What? Who does he play? The director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he plays what I was calling the uh, the third producer. He's the director. So basically, this is a movie. I'm gonna get into it later but it's a it's a really interesting found footage uh film in the series of different found footage films by this director shiraishi <clears throat> and he's famous for something called where is it this this is everything in uh chronological order he's known for this movie called it came a couple years before in 2005 Noroi no really cursed video suicide net he's a fucked up he's a fucked up horror director anyway we'll get into it um but before all of that, there is a lot of weirdness uh, 
kind of surrounding the Valerie and her Week of Wonders film, not only did it sort of come after the true, uh, what do you call it, like era, like saga of the uh, the Czech New Wave, which is more 1965 to 1968, um, when the Prague Spring happens. Um, might get into that a little. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll talk more about the film specifically. But what I wanted to get into up top, the reason <clears throat> I was interested in Valerie and her Week of Wonders initially and what got me, like it was, in, it was recommended by someone, but also there's this album there's an album on Warp Records by a band called Broadcast called Ha Ha Sound. And it is pretty much directly inspired by Valerie and her Week of Wonders. Uh, and I was expecting it to be a lot more horror than it really is. I thought there would be some sort of... Well, actually... There is some shit at the end that's pretty crazy. But I was expecting it to be, like, kind of gory and, like, unspeakable. What's unspeakable ab about it is that it's a, uh, uh, as one person put it, uh, guilty of the thing that it uh, seeks to criticize, which is sort of like this purity culture conundrum about you know, male gaze stuff. And yet the camera itself is like gazing. It's very problematic. Um, and yeah, just probably not the best introduction to that whole genre. But the fact that it's uh, this really great album that I've listened to a lot and uh, it actually sample, it doesn't sample the original soundtrack, <clears throat> but it does... Uh, it does sort of play on the theme of the main film theme. And it's a little bit faster, too, uh, which makes it, which I guess makes watching the film kind of uh, dreamy. The fact that you hear this familiar thing if you're like that into broadcast. And uh, yeah, it's just like, a fun thing to watch. I wouldn't watch it a second time. It's it's mildly like pornographic almost. But I did try and look into. Uh, there was something else, and it wasn't Neutral Milk Hotel. I'm not a huge Neutral Milk Hotel fan, but music inspired by uh, movies or like specific albums inspired by specific films, and you could say that like hard vapor va the vaporwave subgenre or like even classic vaporwave which is sort of like you know just like the early stuff down the middle <clears throat> that that's um it's like blade runner inspired but there's also quite a lot of stuff ranging from like the early 80s on whenever that movie came out that that is a uh, highly highly inspired by it uh and i have a list here of music inspired by movies obviously haha -ha sound broadcast valerie and her week of wonders we have enter the 36 chambers by wu-tang clan uh that's it it pretty much I, it, not verbatim the title of the movie but it's a that's a kung fu film about a guy who goes into all these different um, levels of like a training camp where he learns learns kung fu, and I want to say it's not Bruce Lee. Maybe it's Bruce Lee. Who's who's the lead in Thirty Six Chambers? Hold on, I got to figure out this mic situation. I'm a little bit too far away from it. 36 Chambers film. The 36th Chamber? 
The 36th chamber of the Shaolin, also known as Master Killer, Shaolin Master Killer. 78 Hong Kong Kung Fu film. The film shows a highly fictionalized version of Sante, legendary Shaolin martial arts disciple, who trained under the general, who trained under the general Qi Shan. Yeah, that's not Bruce. It's not Bruce, I'll tell you that. <clears throat> American Gangster, Jay-Z. Haven't seen the movie. I don't know if I've even listened to the album all the way through. I'm not sure. I have James Ferraro's Night Dolls with Hairspray on here. <clears throat> that explores... a. Uh, a lot of like slasher flick type stuff purple rain that doesn't really count because there's i think that's just an that's just a soundtrack to the film itself so under the blade runner section here though we've got uh pop will eat itself this is the day this is the hour this is this from 1989 uh the song wake up Time to Die is built around that quote from Leon when he was about to kill Deckard. I haven't seen Blade Runner either. I've seen most of 2049. That's going on the list here pretty soon. Gary Newman. Gary Newman. The, the new man. He did an album called Outland that has several Blade Runner uh, samples, but he has a few other albums with Blade Runner samples. <laughs> Let me clear my throat real quick. Do 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 do. <clears throat> There's a couple of microphones releases. I only know what I know. I swear, I swear. There's like something that I'm forgetting, and I can't. I don't know what it is, but. On the album Mount Erie, there's, I think it's track three, there's a quote from The Big Lebowski where Walter goes, do you see what happens when you F a stranger in the ass? It's really quite something um, to base like a weird experimental like folk song around. We've got also, I think Wind's Poem by Mount Erie, uh, Phil Olvrum, is uh, largely based around Twin Peaks, the soundtrack, as is the True Anon uh, theme song by their producer, Young Chomsky. Um, and then on this list that I found on like Rate Your Music or something, it had man or astro man, E E V I A C. I think that's Roman numerals. Operational index and reference guide, including other modern computational devices from 1999. I think that's just like a very science fiction. This was all science fiction stuff. You got David Bowie, uh, spider, sp spiders on Mars or whatever. Rush has a couple of albums, Moving Pictures and 21. 12 it's like a uh, very sci-fi janelle monet arc android these are these are albums that are not based on existing movies but are almost like movies in themselves and then also we've got the band nighthawk which i <laughs> i have to say not a fan it's kind of interesting that they exist i I'm tr I've always tried to get into more like 80s, 80s metal stuff, like popular metal. I don't even know what to call it. Album oriented. Is it a uh, hair metal? Is it butt metal? Is that like a derogatory thing? I'm not sure. And then, oh yeah, speaking of uh, what what should we call it? Blade Runner inspired music. A lot of that hard vapor stuff. There's uh, two eight one four. I'll just say that. All the 2814 stuff, it's uh, a uniquely vaporwave style music that doesn't use original samples, but it has the quality of like the Vangelis music, I think. 
like I said, I haven't seen Blade Runner, but I have listened to some Vangelis albums. Let me clear my throat. I got to do the clearing throat. <clears throat> and I got to not smoke hella cigarettes. Um, Tristan Bath from The Quietus said that 2814's Birth of a New Day uh, is an album... Uh, as an album is one of the most powerful depictions of ambient rain soaked urban beauty to have come out in years, noting the Blade Runner inspiration and comparing the album to DJ Shadows and introducing. Introducing definitely use samples though, right? God, that's a great record. I need to listen to that again. And introducing. It's a great title too. And then, oh yeah, the last thing on the list besides this weird, uh, whatchamacallit, silent film I found is 1992 Cool Runnings by Lamborghini Crystal. James Ferraro again. In a collaboration with a guy called JC PV. This has a different uh, album name and a different couple, di a couple different album names, and it goes by like a different uh, band name as well. Grippers Know Their Own Sears Live at Slimer Beach, or it's also known as. 1992 Cool Runnings. And it was on a label called Old English Spelling Bee. <laughs> Very weird, but early James Ferraro stuff. Uh, on one of these Rate Your Music lists or something, someone said that a silent film called Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans from 1927 by F.W. Marnow is similar to Joanna Newsom's Ease. Uh, and I think it's, it's a story of infidelity and I think it might be a weird speculative fiction. So thematically doesn't really fit ease super well, but, uh, yeah, that's all, that's all the specific albums by artists based on specific films but honestly i have to say uh haha -ha sound by broadcast is almost like the prime example that jay-z album is like a really good example too but uh yeah it's hard to say it's hard to say if there's anything else that sort of resembles that in that way the mount erie one for sure for sure. But I would say that a lot of his work and not that one in particular has been inspired by Twin Peaks. Um, but yeah, that's it for the freaking bonus content. Oh yeah, I wanted to say up front, but I for, totally forgot. New comics up every week or so on the Patreon. Three bucks a month. Hit it up. Uh, let's get her going. Let me take a break and clear my throat. And then we will talk about some, uh, movie film stuff. Thank you. Alrighty. Well, I've got a few different ideas for like a double features coming up. I think one of them should probably be check new wave, the next one. And that is gonna be, let's see, Daisies is one I think that was f uh, banned for a while and it was directed by a lady. So let's do that. And then Ikari XB1 or The Voyage at the End of the Universe which is the only like science fiction film in the repertoire of the uh, the Czech New Wave directors. Now, Czech New Wave 
was known for its use of non-professional actors. It was characteristically sort of art born from hardship. It was a country that was not uh, on decidedly one side of the global conflict conflict of world war two. Um, they were sort of victims of the Holocaust. It's, it's a complicated political landscape, but I guess basically from 65 to 68, there was this almost, um, like summer of love kind of thing going on and yeah not only was it like sexual liberation but it was like these intense political commentaries about nazism and communism and central planning the failures of central planning uh the the soviet union as this monolithic like almost like draconian and in in some cases uh power structure and all of the complex things that goes into like being a, a nation with it's why it's one of the like i suppose one of the smaller uh countries to have like a new wave uh in film you've got uh hong kong and france and and uh india but th these are uh i don't know that much larger gdps i guess you could say czechoslovakia not to say that czechoslovakia is like some backwoods like non-country i don't i don't i don't really know about that either but uh it's interesting that such a small country had such a huge uh impact on uh, experimental film at the time, right? So we're definitely got to get into that next week, and it should be fun. But let me tell you what I want to do as a lighthearted sort of antidote to all of this uh, World War Two and like crime stuff. I've been like, I, I love Japanese. I'm I'm falling in love with Japanese movies more and more, but. I want to keep it lighthearted and do two movies about beer that I've never seen. And one of them is a lot more recent than I thought. First one is Strange Brew. And the second one is Beer Fest. I'm not a big drinker myself, <clears throat> but they just kind of came up randomly on the internet for me. And I was like, you know what? Should probably hit those two birds. And then last but not least, uh, Skinamarink has been on my list. And I think uh, the idea of checking out Blair Witch for the first time is is probably on the docket after seeing a cult. It's I've I've described it as the Japanese Blair Witch without having seen the Blair Witch, but it's a very famous like sort of found footage. Oh yeah, the Cure. The Cure is the name of the other uh, the other movie by the guy who did, uh, freaking a cult. So to talk about uh, Valerie in her Week of Wonders, shout out to this YouTuber called Film Qualia, where I got the idea for these other new uh, Czech New Wave films to check out. Film Qualia describes it as a problematically perverse fairy tale ruled by a nightmare logic. And it's pretty cool. I mean, there's, there's pretty badass, like, uh, gothic imagery all throughout this. Uh... The, the pole cat, which I thought, I actually thought that the pole cat was like, a, that was a translation for, for some reason of like meerkat or possibly a ferret. But a pole cat is like its own thing. It kind of looks like a ferret or a meerkat if it was black. But uh, yeah, the, the story largely revolves around 
the the pole cat and the chicken and blood dripping on like this forget me not or daisy or whatever you call it <clears throat> and Valerie ends up uh having her first you know menstruation and then like falling asleep shortly thereafter and you get the sense more or less that the entire movie is just a dream but she's uh accosted by several like full-grown men there's this guy named orlick who right as she falls asleep like steals her earrings from her now he's like her companion and it's said by other characters including her elderly aunt who kind of morphs into her grandma who then becomes a vampire and regains her youth by possessing someone else it's the plot of the film makes decent enough sense in in the fact that it's like certain people are going into certain places and plotting in certain ways and it's like oh there's this person on this faction and you you can lay everything out in a sort of chronological way but the way it snaps back and forth between like okay so this guy is in love with me well first of all she's 13 years old and like the actress is 13 years old so there isn't a person her age like whatsoever who's like shown an interest in her it doesn't show her like interacting with like boys or girls from like the the parish that are like her own age or whatever it's just it's it's i think supposed to be this huge veiled metaphor for like how uh how horrific it is to be flown into the world of adulthood as a girl who is predated on right and it's it makes a it makes a pretty decent uh attempt but it is directed like by a guy uh as like 90 percent of the czech new wave uh directors were guys don't know the name of the dude but we're gonna get into this other this other stuff next week ikari xb1 sounds really cool it sounds really cool it's like this it's like this uh it's the story about a bunch of humans who are like on a spaceship and they're like isolated from earth and it's kind of about that <clears throat> um i don't know what else i really want to say about valerie and her week of wonders like i said it came after 68 which is when uh you know the prog spring i don't know a lot about it but from what i gathered earlier today this guy named alexander dubik was elected uh, secretary of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, first secretary. Not like the first in history, but that's like the title, right? Um, so, Valerie and her Week of Wonders in 1970, it's not even the most racy. Daisies for being um, having a food fight in it during a time when there was like a famine going on. Uh, but that, that was a major part of why it was banned temporarily. And then this other one by, there was another film that was banned indefinitely by a guy who I'll talk about it probably more in depth next week if I get a chance but he made a film that was like a flat out satire of like the central planning committees in Czechoslovakia and that got banned for like eternity like I'm not even sure if like you're allowed you're supposed to watch it in Russia now maybe after maybe after 1990 that should change but I don't really know for sure um not much else to say about valerie uh 
kind of just trying to get this one in the bag and think of something fun and lighthearted for next week's episode. Um, yeah, a pole cat is often, well, it's literally means a cat that eats chickens because po, 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 pollo, pole, I don't know if that's Latin or something. It means, uh, it means chicken. So it means like chicken cat. Oh, yeah. And also it's kind of like a queer thing. That's the other thing I would say is that there's like a lot of uh, women who uh, enter into the picture. And at one point she even shares a bed with one of them. Uh, So, yeah, there was there was some sense of like free love and like queerdom that might have bled out from like the summer of love culture i don't really know but it's it's it is strange to say the least that this film does at at for short periods and in some weird ways i guess uh makes this statement about like puritanism and purity culture while also um i don't know like it's it's not something they should have done it's not something i'm sure is even uh like legal by some standards <laughs> you know it's it's not something that i'm proud to have like gone down this rabbit hole but it is it did spurn the list of uh interesting albums which by the way if you have any recommendations <clears throat> submit them to the pod on the like twitter subscribe subscribe to the patreon submit them there that's that's the way to do it check out my comics uh do the patreon three dollars a month but watch some Czech new wave with me next week. And that's going to be Ikari XB one and daisies. But we're going to talk about a lot of other stuff too. Might even watch some other feature length films. We're doing the horror stuff still, but I even, I mean, over on the Twitch, but I even made a left turn from that and watched a cult, which we're going to talk about next uh, and spoiler alerts for sure, because it's hard. It's hard not to spoil this one. It boils like a frog, you know. It kind of it. It's you see it coming the entire way, sort of like what's gonna happen. Freaky, freaky movie. Uh, I'm surprised it isn't a little bit more talked about. I'm not sure. Uh, humble brag, I guess, for having a really cool taste and stuff. <laughs> All right. Yes. Well, I have been talking about Kiyoshi Kurosawa a lot on the podcast, and he actually makes an appearance in this movie as himself. And uh, he's like, yeah, I'm a horror director. I've been looking at that rock that you're interested in. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty freaky rock. What can I say? And they're like, we found this thing uh, there. And he's like, how did you find that? And they're like, there's this like hidden hole. And he's like, damn. And then it, the, scre- the screen fades to black. And it's like, Kurosawa went back to the rock but he couldn't find the hole that we were talking about it was like damn but they got him they got him for a few scenes it's not even a cameo it's like i guess he's like a fairly obscure director i guess maybe to american audiences i'm like humble bragging all over the place i'm trying to be like not a pretentious hipster about the shit but uh he's like 
he's like kind of a big deal. I want to see this movie uh, Cure, but we've got Koji Shiraishi. He's made a ton of these like uh, just freaky freaky found footage style horror movies um and one of them is like do, 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 do i have it here the one i was thinking of earlier is called noroi the curse not the cure cure is a uh, Kuros- kurosawa but he also what are the other ones the Cure, 2007, Grotesque, Occult, Teke Teke, and Teke Teke 2, and then Cult, without the O. Is that a found footage one? Yeah, all of his movies are found footage for some reason, but it says here he directed, and I'm very interested in some of his more recent stuff, Welcome to the Occult Forest TV series. And then they made a movie of that in 2022. Interesting. His most recent thing is called Aishi Teru. Misa is an underground idol and being filmed closely for a documentary one day. An owner of a BDSM Club H perceived Misa's potential and headhunts her as a dominatrix. Misa's confused at first, but when she meets the top dominatrix, Kanan, she learns sexual pleasure she'd ever do. She then decides to pursue a career of both idols and be. Oh, whoa. Oh, safe word. Safe word is the English title. That's awesome. That's fucked up. But no, okay, so Shibuya 2036, a 2021 TV series. Shibuya, the year is 2036. Shibuya is also where a lot of uh, occult takes place. In contrast to the front face of the city. Okay, so basically it's um, it's just outside of downtown Tokyo. So it's, I don't know if it's like considered a borough of Tokyo, but it's part of Tokyo province. Uh, the city has its huge skyscrapers. The backside of Shibuya is a home ground for WeTubers. Mitsuru, played by Yada Yada, and Karuku, played by Yada Yada, who grew up together as orphans, live a life at the bottom of the ladder with no family, education, or money, but they gr- dream of a great turnaround in their lives by becoming popular WeTubers. One day they encounter a mannequin uncle. What? Played by Shohei Uno. When he releases a video of his encounter with the suspicious mannequin uncle, the number of views on their channel increases dramatically. Viewers begin asking him for advice and they decide to help solve their prob- to help solve their problems. Or they soon find their selves caught up in a puzzling case. I wonder if that was translated. A mannequin uncle? I don't know what that means at all. <clears throat> I don't know what that means at all. I wonder what else. He did something called Hell Girl in 2019. Tormented and bullied people can access a special website run by a hell girl who will enable them, enable, enable them to take revenge on their torturers. The price for such a service is only that the person must join their torturer in damnation. Weird. So anyway, a cult. <laughs> Uh, a cult begins on August 12, 2005. There is a place called Mayogasaki. It's kind of like a mountainous region with like a uh, sound kind of under underneath it, like a big body of water. Kind of reminds me of some places in Washington. 
but the, these people are like on a giant bridge, not a giant bridge, but like a bridge that's suspended very high over some water between these two like rocky islands, I guess you could say. <clears throat> um, and a stabbing takes place and it's captured on video with this girl or by this girl who turns out to be the documentary, one of three documentary filmmakers of the film that we're like watching like right now currently. And uh, so you've got this lady who is at the site of the original stabbing by this guy named Ken Matsuki. And I think it shows like some newspaper clips and shit. This guy stabs two people and wounds a third. And then he sort of lurches forward. And it's, this is all caught on camera by one of these girl producers. I don't even know if it ever says her name, but she plays a pretty prominent role. Uh, it's hard to say who's who because there's no... Uh, <clears throat> it's an obscure enough movie to where there's like not uh, actors pictures for the for the cast on like IMDb. But anyway, she's like the original inspiration and she's teamed up with these two other producers. Um, and she's going around. It turns out they're interviewing a bunch of different people and it's really crafty because it's like you can tell that they're presenting this fictional, it's a mockumentary. So they're presenting this fictional story in like a way where it's like, okay, they produced this footage and then the story took shape. The first like 30 minutes of the movie, you don't really know where it's going because they're interviewing a whole bunch of different people, including like uh, there's someone who plays herself named Peiko Watanabe who's like this anime artist. And then as I mentioned before, uh, Kurosawa, <clears throat> they play themselves. And then there's like early on, there's an interview with one of the victims of the stabbings girl, girl's mother, one of the girls who died. And she says, uh, that she has, she's haunted by like these, um, She's haunted by these dreams where someone is saying uh, Ahira Wama, which I guess in Japanese, some sort of uh, homonym type action happening, she thought m was uh, meant I'm home, or maybe she interpreted it. She said, I think this means I'm home. I don't really know what that means. And that's, that's like I said, the victim one of the victim girl's mothers. So <clears throat> one of the other guys who is interviewed is named Shohei Ino. And he survived after getting like slashed multiple times after like, okay, so something weird happened where this other girl who is the 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 first I'll call her the first producer of the movie itself whatever this occult that we're watching <clears throat> um she catches it on footage where like his legs freeze up and he's caught on the ground without being able to walk for some inexplicable reason and as they keep on going interviewing him at first they're interviewing him like out in the street corner where there's it's like kind of an open area and there's some construction going on and uh they learn that like he's homeless there's this weird reference to like how many of the people from the stabbing are like homeless now because they say like are they living at like the internet cafes the the middle part of the film largely explores Shohei Ino in his impoverished state, kind of. They're like they're slowly getting to know him. They're slowly realizing that 
he has this strange attitude towards Ken Matsuki, who, I'll remind you, is a guy who, like, walked up to him after he was magically paralyzed and mutilated him and then walked away and disappeared into another dimension after jumping off a cliff. Like, they never found Ken Matsuki, right? But... Even so, like his attitude towards the whole thing is like, uh, okay, and that's that. This is the weird thing is that the slashes that he made on him are like a weird pattern, and this is the pattern that they show to Kurosawa, and he actually he uh, he spells out basically the plot of the entire rest of the movie for them about midway through. By saying, oh, these are ancient Japanese symbols for God-ordained death. And then the other one is God-ordained calamity, right? And Ken Matsuki is seen in old pictures to have the one, the symbol that says God-ordained death. And they're similar symbols, but different in that one of them is... Uh, referring to like okay you uh something smaller basically so it gets laid out that you know this guy's living in poverty pivotal scene in the movie is when the three producers they've taken him into their studio where nobody else is living but they're letting somehow they're trusting him being this like whatever they they offer him a job collecting footage of these strange anomalous things that he calls miracles he claims to have seen ufos um people very early on in the film interviews about people who knew ken matsuki say that he was really into ufos as well so what's happening here is basically like a weird devil possession <clears throat> two pivotal scenes in the movie the producers are going through Ino uh, Shohei Ino's stuff while he's on he's like a temporary worker so he has to call like the place a lot for how low budget this movie is the the plot is incredibly complex and crafty like it's it's a completely like autodidact and like you could say that a lot of the technology especially especially like the final scene of this movie <laughs> which spoiler alerts i'm gonna get into but the great thing about this movie also is that it's like a jumping off point for i think a whole series of like this this kind of universe that he's created anyway pivotal scene they realize that this guy is not actually impoverished they look at some bank statements that they find while he's away at work and they're like, oh my God, he has like 70,000, 700,000 or 70,000 yen or something, which is the you know equivalent of like thousands of dollars. And he's saving it up for some reason. <clears throat> they don't really know why. And shortly after he scores some footage where like he goes, <sighs> so he brings the camera with him to work like, like that same day. And there's this guy who's antagonizing him saying, hey, I'm, uh, you know, it's and conveniently, there's like a lot of really cool like subtitles that are like kind of in the middle of the screen that are like explain what's going on. It's almost like the conventions of a silent film. It's very like artful. Like I said, it's like it's a very amateur film, but it's like there's a lot of craft that goes into it. It's, it's, it's very clever in some ways. Um, it's explained that this guy is like their group leader on this temporary job that they have. And he walks up to him and he goes, he doesn't know that he's filming him or whatever. And he goes, uh, listen, you better do better. Cause you weren't fuck. You were fucking up and making us all go. It doesn't even explain what the job was, which is like, so weird. Like he's just doing menial labor for a temp agency which i guess is something similar you'd see in america or or whatever but but it seems to be like this urban uh homeless person lifestyle i don't really know like the thing with the 24-hour anime cafes is like they have showers for some reason it's it's all very confusing it's i, I think it takes place around tokyo it's very urban very urban environment 
So pivotal scene is that. And then he gets all this footage where he's following this guy who's antagonizing him and saying, oh, you probably just shouldn't show up tomorrow. He's like kind of threatening his livelihood. And it slowly comes out through a series of them also uh, hanging out with him at this restaurant. So he gets this footage and he shows it to them. They pay him. He goes, oh, I want to take you guys out. You know, he takes them out earlier after he gets he gets a job. It's all it's all very cut and dry, you know, but through these two restaurant meetings, they're filming and it slowly comes out that he has this whole idea about the miracles that like he's been possessed. Right. But the second meeting, only the main producer who I'll call the third producer who is, uh, I believe the guy who's played by the director himself. Um, fucking, it's a very hard name to remember. Whatever his name is, Shiraishi Koji Shiraishi Shira. If I just remember Koji Shira, like the like the cartoon character. Anyway, um, I believe this is a guy who's played by the director himself and he's got these glasses and a beard and he's like a kind of a thicker face. The second meeting, he's the only one who goes along because the other two are sitting there and they go, Oh, I have plans. I can't, I can't really. So it's just them two. Right. And he goes opening up. It's very crafty. He goes, you know, I, this thing about the miracles and you think you're possessed. I think I want to help you. And he goes, okay, here's how you can help me. This is what I believe. Blah, 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 blah. I'm going to plan. Okay. So I told you about the voices that I heard, but I didn't tell you what they, I told, told you that I didn't know what they meant, but I did know what they mean. And it was, you know, like suicide bombing in Shinjo or what is it? The, the, uh, what is it called? The station Shibuya station suicide bombing in the Shibuya station. Right. And so they're like, for some reason, Ino, who he convinces them to call Ino Kun instead of Ino San, which I guess is like this Western dialect thing and also like an informal thing. You know, there's there's this really interesting conversation they have about informality. And it's like, I can't understand what people are saying when they use informal dialects. And he's like, oh, we're from the West Coast. You're from Tokyo. <clears throat> but anyway, he's like, I thought we were friends, yada, yada, yada. He somehow convinces him in this second solo meeting in the restaurant to go along with him. <laughs> he's going to kill. He's going to kill so many people in the Shibuya station. He... He's like, he c- confirms that, yes, he's been researching how to make bombs. It's it's like <laughs> the movie takes a dramatic turn at this point where it's like, oh, shit. Okay, so the director, wait, not only is like the main guy who we've been following for like an hour, but also the guy behind the camera who has like this meta connection to the story as like also a protagonist, but it's... Wait, what am I watching? Wait, what? They they go to a store and get some nails and pipes and like random uh, chemicals and shit. And uh, so basically, Eno thinks that he's going to he's going to explode, and he's going to be he's going to pass on into like heaven or quote unquote God's country or something, whatever he says. Uh. And he's going to take all the people that he kills with him. And they have this argument where he's like, okay, so even if you are going to heaven, like you're taking these people, you're imposing your will on them. It's like an, it's like this argument they have about like wrath and stuff. And that's how somehow he convinces him to go along. But when they're out buying all the supplies and they have this huge duffel bag full of like random shit and it's really heavy, this 
just random guy on the street accosts them and tries to take the bag and it cuts back and forth and they steal the bag back and forth from each other. And the guy's just going, it's hell, it's hell. We find out later that Ahi Rawama, which is what the uh, one of the victim's mothers said came to her in a dream, means the mountain of the leech. And these paranormal things start happening. Not only do people see these ghost things, these black balls of like yarn almost going through the sky on the video and in person when they're like out drinking, there's this thing where like leeches and you find out that that mountain is called the mountain of the leech and there's that rock on it and the rock has the symbology it all ties together like by the end of it but they keep one of the paranormal things that happens is they keep getting a row of leeches and this i think the same guy starts bleeding from the same the same place where the reach the leeches originally were uh, it was a tongue twister but anyway he's like a suicide bombing massacre at the Shibuya station. If I become a super suicide bomber, I will not die. Um, so my prediction at this point was that it ends with Eno dying, but then also sending a video along. We do, towards the very end of the movie, see the first producer, the girl who was there, die in real time from the suicide the suicide bombing happens and it's filmed like from inside a bus and the main the third producer uh the guy with the glasses is trying to get the first producer in the bus so that she doesn't die but it's like bam huge explosion it's like a nuclear explosion where like a hundred 108 people die 245 were injured or something so the guy carrying the camera, the third producer, Mr. Director himself, goes to prison for... Tw so this is the last, like, 15 minutes. He goes to prison for, like, uh, 20 years or something. But right before the bombing happened, they had this conversation where he's like, hey, I owed you money from earlier when they went to an internet cafe and he, he loaned him, like, 100 yen. It's like, here, I'll give you the money back. And he goes, better yet, send me the... He said, he brings a camera with him, too, for some reason. Send me the camera and the money after you go to the other place, right? It's all sorts of weird twists and turns. You kind of know what's coming, right? The The two remaining producers, after the one gets out of prison meet up for tea or something and some hot pot at uh, one of the places that they, I think previously is featured in the film. There's like a lot of public places and restaurants. It's almost hard to keep track, but they're hanging out and they're like reminiscing and then bam, the camera and the coin like just fall from the ceiling. But Okay, so the other place is real, but the thing that the guy who tried to steal their bag was saying comes back. And what you see inside the tape, inside the camera that get, gets magically dropped from the ceiling in this restaurant 20 years later is... <laughs> Visually, I, I won't spoil like what it is, but there are like basically jellyfish. Those like black balls of yarn are like jellyfish. It's hell. It's hell, folks. He's suffering for eternity and he's going, listen, uh, you need to help me. Please help me. <laughs> and graphically, graphically, it's very, it's probably the most amateurish part of the entire movie but uh it had to go somewhere and it's it's hard to forget what there's a lot of like beheadings that happen towards the last like 15 minutes it's very very brutal but also the graphics are kind of so bad that you don't uh you don't worry about it too much it doesn't like affect you because i don't know 
maybe I just don't get super, maybe I'm just uh, detached. I don't get super, uh, what's what's the word for it? Um, in th- uh, uh, it's the opposite of willful suspension of disbelief or whatever. When you get immersed, that's the word I'm looking for. Maybe I just don't get easily immersed. But yeah, that is Occult. We might check out some of the sequels to that. Godfather 2 is on the list, but uh, let's wrap it up for today. We'll see you next week with some Czech New Wave Cinema, Daisies, and what's it called again? Ikari XB1. That's on the docket. That's on the docket before we get to beer, lighthearted beer movies, and then some more spoopy some more spoop um shout outs to the check new wave not the pervy dudes but maybe the sci-fi dudes and the chicks all right we're out of here bye